welcome back everybody um or if you were here that's fine too our next presentation is from jessica where email as a record building institutional support for email archiving at a small liberal arts college take it away jessica uh you might want to unmute <laughs> got it i'm just sharing my screen thank you um, um, oops, sorry. Thank you, everyone. Right. Hello, and welcome to Email as Record, building institutional support for email archiving at a small liberal arts college. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be presenting. This presentation will have a higher education focus specifically for small institutions. We are a Google institution, but I firmly believe that the constructs I discuss are replicable anywhere. I'd like to begin with the following in honor of Williams College's partnership and friendship with the Stockbridge Muncie community. We respectfully acknowledge that Williams College stands on the ancestral homelands of the Stockbridge Muncie Mohicans, who are the indigenous peoples of the region now called Williamstown. Following tremendous hardship after being forced from their valued homelands, they continue as a sovereign tribal nation in Wisconsin, which is where they reside today. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors, past and present, as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. So why are we here? Hopefully we don't all have that mess. With good records management, email preservation and archiving does not mean keeping all email because we can. Not all emails are record. We of course, in a higher education environment, use email to communicate casually like, hey, what's up? As well as communicate policy, procedure and changes at our institution. Some records like emails, PDFs, TikTok, move files and VHS tapes are containers of information, of course. And I'd like to begin with the beginning, something we all know as information professionals. As technology changes, so do our containers of information or holders of records. Um, as technology changes, so does everything. Um, Socrates and Phaedrus lamented a shift from oral knowledge to text. He was certain text was problematic and could not truly hold, hold a record. Today, this is echoed with those who lament digital books, social media, emails, and gifts that they can't be true records or holders of information. And this might be echoed in IT departments at small liberal arts colleges or your institution. Fortunately, IT at Williams is incredibly supportive and a wonderful partner with my email archiving practices. Correctly, these containers do not always hold records but some do, and without archiving some of the containers like email, some Instagram, some text messages, some TikTok, there would be a top, only a top-down representation of our institutional histories and history in general. Email and other born digital records like non-text records and oral histories add to the richness of our stories beyond the physical text. Public institutions must follow state mandated records policies and schedules, and this includes email, often gathered using a capstone approach. Liberal arts colleges and private institutions have the ability to experiment, to improve and expand what good records management and institutional histories mean. This includes being really creative with email archiving. Some small liberal arts colleges, unlike universities, large ones, and our European counterparts have been hesitant to view institutional email as record, and this is common at small liberal arts colleges. Fortunately, Williams has been supportive of email preservation and archiving processes, giving me a lot of space to experiment with workflows, work with policies, and solidify processes for archiving the broadcast emails of the college, which includes the all staff listservs, all faculty, faculty listservs, all student email listservs, and we are moving forward with archiving curated groupings from staff, faculty, and students. Let's quickly review Williams College and its background. Williams is a private institution was founded in 1793 on Stockbridge Muncie land. We are a small liberal arts college located in Western Massachusetts in the town of Williamstown. Williams is highly selective with an acceptance rate of less than 13%. 
There is a seven to one faculty to student ratio. The records management policy was approved by the trustees in 2016. Our wonderful, wonderful president, Maud Mandel, is a historian herself and has made it a campus priority to examine Williams institutional histories. The endowment is large, allowing us the space to think about more digital archiving processes for and email practices in a small place. Because of the endowment, Williams became the first higher education institution to eliminate loans and is all grant based. And I'm going to start us off with a definition of capstone, which all of you should know if you're interested in email archiving. It, of course, is the approach used by governmental institutions and public universities. The capstone approach is a method of email management that bases appraisal and scheduling on the account owner's role or position rather than individual content, individual email content as a means of simplifying and automating the process. The approach developed by the National Archives addresses the overwhelming volume of email and the need for a more simplified and automated approach for managing it. This approach identifies and preserves the accounts of individuals who by virtue of their work or position, which is often very high up, are likely to create and receive valuable records. With email, capstone works except when it doesn't. It's of course a logical response to the digital deluge and a very efficient one. However, by only targeting and archiving email of those in positions of authority, bias enters in. And this is something we need to examine. Of course, it's important to preserve presidential records. I'm very passionate about that and other administrative records. At Williams, these are vital record groups. And as I said, I'm excited about them. However, when we only gather from a top-down perspective, our records will reflect a top-down hierarchy rather than the multitude of voices. As information professionals, I think it's crucial we reflect on this. And I suggest to encourage continuing to archive email records of presidents, deans, and vice presidents, but begin uncapstoning for diversity and collecting a wide range of email voices as record to represent institutional histories. Without born digital archiving like email, social media, memes, and other digital forms of communication, our contemporary collections would not have very many historical narratives. Like oral histories, born digital archiving, especially email archiving, enriches institutional histories. Overall, in records management, using the capstone approach, the appraisal and selection focus has traditionally been on records with a top level or capstone administrative, fiscal or legal or research value. I imagine us as email archivists introducing two other points of focus with email archiving, social and cultural email records as vital evidentiary records for places of higher education. This particular email is from, is from a student group, Sisterhood. With their collaboration and understanding, we are preserving their records. We archive their email listserv and their digital records, which includes conversations about occurrences on campus and events. Sisterhood's mission is a primary goal of this organization will be to instill a sense of unity and community amongst black women and to help support those who identify as black women to the outside community. Sisterhood aims to provide black women students with a solid platform to address issues that are both undetected and overlooked. Sisterhood embodies self-awareness, self-care, self-confidence, and self-love. Are these email records as important as the dean of faculties or dean of students and the president's email records? I affirm that yes, both enhance and enrich the other. They are in conversation. This is good institutional history and record keeping. Now, as seen in previous slides, capstone reflecting a top-down method of recording histories reflects in a lack of diversity in institutional historical record. How can we as records managers, archivists, information and professionals and historians and those in cultural heritage organizations counter this? Audience, I encourage you to reflect on this. You might ask, how am I answering this at Williams? Well, I'm using capstone, but at the same time, uncapstoning by gathering a multitude of email records from a variety of voices like student groups, various listservs and encouraging self curation for staff and faculty. We are encouraging, enriching the record and encouraging the record at Williams by preserving a wide range of email as record, including email as record that would typically be part of the capstone approach like this email. By deconstructing traditional ideas of valuable records and institutional records management practices, 
Curation and collaborative inclusion in the archives allows more members of the campus communities to understand the importance of their roles in campus operations, culture creation, and preservation, like email preservation. It also expands our institutional histories and what we consider important as we reflect on the past. I'd like to discuss how to make it work, including uncapstoning. Here's my low barrier email archiving toolkit, toolkit for small institutions. I'm gonna review the following, having like a records information management committee or team, doesn't have to be a committee, official or unofficial, a records policy I think is essential if you wanna be collecting email, um, OIT and data management policies, individual schedules, personal archiving, which is also essential, and actually my process on how to do it, which is using Email Archiver Pro, accessioning and processing digital preservation, and then hopefully access soon. Having a records policy is essential in building an email archiving program. The policy should include that records can be in any format. The Williams College Board of Trustees voted to approve the policy in October 2016. This policy affirms the records management program at the college and the role of the records manager. Importantly, the policy states records can be recorded in any physical form or medium, including hard copy or electronic. This, of course, includes email, while some email is not all email are records. I encourage you to form an unofficial or official records management group or committee. This is your support team. Talk with them about email as record. At Williams, the initial committee was made up of the following, the records manager, digital resources archivist, who I am, the OIT director, the library director, the OIT head of administrative systems, college counsel, which is the lawyer of the college, the president's office, a representative from, and faculty members. Currently, most of the records management decisions are now based with myself, records manager, and college counsel. Does your institution have data policies? Have you connected these policies with record policies? Data policies can often form without archival or records management insight and without thinking about email archiving from that perspective, insert yourself in the conversation. I suggest working with IT and aligning data policy with records policy. Our data policy, which is an IT policy, states college records as described in detail and the policy regarding the management of college records are vital for essential business workflows of the college. Some data as containers of records are historical or legally required to be maintained for certain time periods. Data that fits either of these requirements must be preserved or disposed of in accordance to the college's records policy and associated records retention schedules. Do you have a general records retention schedule? If not, you should. Um, ours is an official addendum to the trustees records policy. The Williams general schedule includes the following. Email is an electronic form of correspondence. As such, it's subject to the retention guidelines developed by your office in cooperation with the records manager. If your office has yet to meet with the records manager, a good rule of thumb follows routine correspondence dealing with general administrative matters should be retained three years and then confidential disposition. Correspondence recording significant transactions, projects, events, and operations. Um, should go to the records manager for permanent retention. This transfer may happen annually or at separation. The records manager preserves the staff, faculty, and student listservs. This may be disposed of. Recommendation is one year. At Williams, individual records retention schedules include email correspondence that record, are recorded as a record series. These are collaborative schedules owned by myself, the records manager, the unit, and college counsel. They are revised as records alter and are shared within the unit. Some email is clearly indicated as a form of record. This in theory encourages good personal archiving practices and having people and units think about what email am I creating is a record and what's not a record. Personal archiving and curation. Everyone is an archivist. I have a series of digital decluttering trainings for the Williams community, do many personal archiving consults for student groups, academic departments, administration, faculty, and staff. This is an excellent place to discuss email archiving. I always say in the trainings, I'm passionate in the idea that we're all archivists and curation is more important than ever to make sure our histories do not disappear into the digital dust or deluge. 
This means pinpointing digital files and email that might be records too. My colleagues in OIT have added the following to their student directed emails that go out to all the students. If you are part of a student group and think you have records of historical value, please reach out to the records manager who can help you digitally preserve your materials for future access. We want to make sure the diverse voices of students do not decay into the digital deluge. Here are some examples from my decluttering or digital life trainings at Williams, which is my thinly veiled initiative to get people to curate their own email from the beginning of the life cycle and decipher what is record and what is not record. Why clean up your email? It's more sustainable. It decreases server and energy using. It helps the earth. It's a more efficient process to retrieve information. Information sharing reduces redundancies, and we want to meet the campus goal of reducing space by January 2024. And if you are other Google institutions, you understand that. Another example from the trainings is, this is what you should ask when you create email. Is it significant? Does the email establish policy or procedure? Does the email provide recommendations? Does the email describe administrative actions taken or planned? Does the email have legal or evidential value? Now, finally, how to do it. I'm gonna go through this quickly. I'm thinking about having a low barrier training for this at another conference, although my workflow might change, but here is a brief overview. First, I encourage self-curation via personal archiving from the beginning of the life cycle, which I realize is difficult to encourage, and Google Takeout. I encourage self-curation and personal archiving using the records policy and records retention schedules, announcement trainings and units or personal visits. This is the asking of what is a record. I encourage email transfer via Google, Google Takeout either annually or at a set time or when leaving the institution. This is part of our offboarding workflow at Williams and is part of the steps for retire, retirement coming from records management, human resources, IT, and the Dean of Faculty's office. So when someone retires, they have to think about their email and what to archive. I use Email Archiver Pro, low barrier tool to convert MBOX to PDF as an artifact. I save both the MBOX and the PDF. Um, the link for this tool is provided at the end of the slides. To use it, it requires that email is already in inbox form. Next, accessioning, processing, and digital preservation. For records that may contain sensitive information, I run PDF grep to identify protected information. OIT and myself excise the protected information. I then arrange and describe the email like any records, paper, or born digital material in archive space, um, which is our um, description system. I also preserve the records in our digital preservation server or for records that might have restrictions, they go into a highly secure partition of the digital preservation server. Now, next steps, um, EPAD for access. I missed the grant, I was too busy and I missed the grant for this wonderful group, which I serve on the advisory board for. And I'm keenly aware of what my wonderful email archivist colleagues are doing. And I'd like to move forward with this next step for student group emails and our publicly accessible emails. Google no longer provides unlimited storage for educational institutions. So I think a lot of my records management and archival peers are working in that, in that area too, who are in the Google realm. So I plan with great collaboration and support with OIT to have more all-campus digital curation, personal archiving trainings, hackathons, and group deletion and preservation events with food, maybe. We had a number in late spring, and we had more than 200 attendees, which is really exciting, and I'd like to have more, and I think it's essential we have more. My mantra for personal archiving and email curation is all of us at Williams will need to do our part to limit growth by decluttering our digital lives and through data and records management, stewardship, and reducing our footprint with fossil fuels. Some of the data you're storing may be records or essential for your time at Williams. Other files might be inactive or less important or possibly just taking up digital space. Lastly, PDF specifications for email archiving. I like to make sure our email PDFs as artifact are using the newly de developed specifications for email. This will be an ideal next step. I think Chris knows this. Um, here are some links to everything we discussed. And I did share my slides. Um, thank you very much. And I am very excited to take your questions after my email archivist colleagues talk. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Ruby.
Yeah, thank you so much, Jessica. Um, really, really wonderful talk and interesting. I have to confess, I'm not familiar with Email Archiver Pro, so I'm going to have to check <laughs> it out because it appears to do some PDF um, conversion there. But we do have a couple of questions in the chat, if you have a few moments before we transition over to um, Maria, who's our next speaker. Sure. Hi, Maria. Hi. Congratulations to your amazing presentation, Jessica. Oh, thank you. Do you want, I don't see the chat code. Do you want me right, to? Right, I'm happy to read them off, Jessica. Yeah. That works for you. So um, the first one says, for Williams College, is there an automatic transfer of email records or do you have to track people to get it done? I think that may have come in before you talked a little bit about Google Takeout. But if you yeah. want to maybe give us a little bit more context there. Usually when, when I do do capstone, it's um, working with the the individual as they um, are leaving their administrative position. Um, we do not have automatic at this point. It is opt in where compliance does become very complicated. Um, and I'm not sure about auto. I guess. I would love to do an automated process. You're getting me thinking about so many exciting things, but yes, that would be an excellent next step. But right now we do not, besides Google Takeout. Great. There are and, um, ways to do that. Great, right. Thank you. And then um, this may be a little bit of a can of worms, but do you have an automated way of following FERPA uh, or restricting access to confidential student information? when you open it up to student organization emails? Um, that is for PDF grep. And we've discussed what is sensitive and what not. Um, what, um, so PDF grep will recognize um, like social security numbers and, and yes. So we don't have an automated, PDF grep would be automated, but I'm hoping the process comes when uh, people identify what is a record that is going to be preserved and what's not. But I would love to do more automated processes with this, but right now it's PDF grub. And we have, and I can send you, if I get your email, I can send you what we consider sensitive. And that is all listed in our records retention schedules too. So a lot of this is um, offices and units and those who are archiving their email to think about what would be sensitive from the beginning of the life cycle. Great. Try to answer that succinctly, but please email me and we can talk about it more. I love talking about this. Yeah. And and then, um, give Maria time. <laughs> right. We're getting a little bit short on time here. I do think we have another uh, minute or two for a question before we turn things over to Maria. But um, um, again, this resonated with me as well. Um, but someone says your digital declutter program sounds great. How do you assess, how do you assess that is success in encouraging self-curation? Um, decluttering to the impact of the records management program. And yeah, I know those quality assurance and, and measures of success are always a little bit tricky, but do you have any thoughts about that, uh, Jessica? I just, I did these trainings pre-pandemic and we did have like a Google form afterwards asking what people thought of the presentation, but this is excellent to get me to think about data. I often come in from a more um, a different perspective than collecting data, which I'm really excited about Maria's um, presentation because of that. But um, yes, I should be thinking about, I, I think about it in terms of how many offices and units work with me throughout the year. And I viewed it as, as a success after my presentations a month ago, I have about 15 units on campus who want to work with me updating their records retention schedule, thinking about digital schedules, but I should definitely record this more and think of a, a better data management approach for it. Thank you for that wonderful question. Yeah, that's wonderful. I mean, 15 reach outs after your presentations, that's um, quite a testimony, I would say, to the success of what you're doing. So <laughs> Ruby so, saw my calendar. So she, yeah, <laughs> right. She knows how busy I am. But yeah. I am so pleased to be here. And I thank you, Chris, again, for yeah. 
we they do have to, okay. we do have a few additional questions, which if you have some time to stay on here as a panelist, you can feel free to answer those in chat um, yes. or in the QA section. But I'm now going to turn things over to Maria Benauer, um, who is going to tell us about uh, her work at the University of Vienna. And so excited to see that and so excited to see your um, upcoming slide with your somewhat circuitous journey, which appears as if it's it's led you through regions of the world that I've I had the opportunity to work in as well at one point in, in the UK or thereabouts. So Maria, over to you. I'll give you a second to share your screen here and really looking forward to the answer to the why question, which is the one that always comes up in conversations. Thank you, Chris, um, for that kind introduction. I'm just gonna share my slides. Is everything working? Can you see it? Um, we're currently seeing uh, the entire the entirety of PowerPoint um, as opposed to just the presentation. Okay. Um... Uh, it should be, is it working now? No, not really. Sorry for that. Um, ah, there we go. Nope, now we have the presenter view. <laughs> yeah, um, wait a second. I'm really sorry for that. That's because I have two screens and I've never done a presentation with two screens. <laughs> That's tricky, I know. So yeah. take your time. No, no worries whatsoever. Okay. Um, I'm gonna take that over. That looks great, Maria. Oh, you're muted, unfortunately. Okay, so now we're ready. Sorry for that. And thank you, Chris, uh, for the kind introduction. And thank you to you, Chris and Ruby for, for organizing that symposium. Uh, it's just such a fantastic format and I've been researching and email archiving since 2019 and it is just fantastic to see the community growing year by year and I'm really happy to be part of this uh, format today. Well, following up on Jessica's super useful practical tips, um, my presentation will take you on a journey into the archival theoretical dust around email archiving. Today I'm going to talk about my previous project on government email as a historical source. So what can you expect from the next 10 minutes? First of all, I'm going to introduce myself in order to illuminate my approach to email archives. After that, I will give a brief overview of the idea of German source studies to then present my final findings and reflect a little bit on the question how they could also serve an international email archiving community. Considering email as a historical source has been a kind of an unintended byproduct of my research. In fact, it was the consequence of a rather irritating experience, but that just covers most of my professional biography so far. I hold an MSc in information management and preservation from the University of Glasgow and an MA in auxiliary sciences of history and archival studies from the University of Vienna. And from my experience, Sitting between the stools in terms of archival languages, traditions, and discourses easily leads to irritation, because what is normal in one context may be unnormal in another. But as a doctoral candidate in archival science, I really enjoy harvesting this tension because I'm just passionate about sharing knowledge across um, archival climate zones. And it is important to know that my research is strongly influenced by the method of comparison and informed by the assumption that archives are a product of sociocultural context. That's just important to know in advance. So let's go over to my irritating email experience then. 
and here's just a friendly reminder um Austria is not Australia, which is quite often confused. I'm pretty sure you all know that, but yeah, that's always fun to know. As I've said before, I've been conducting research in email archiving since 2019. In particular, I'm interested in the appraisal of government email in Austria and also German in a more general context. After four years of research, however, my results are rather daunting as there is still little awareness for email as a record here in Austria. But please let me that elaborate this a little bit more in detail. In 2020, I have written a scholarly article on major challenges and chances in the appraisal of government email. As far as I know, this article is the first discussion of the capstone approach, as already discussed by Jessica in a German-speaking context. From 2020 until 2021, I then conducted an in-depth case study with an Austrian state archive in order to evaluate current national practice as a part of my master's dissertation. My findings were alarming because they indicated that Austrian archives should question the, the reliability of electronic records management system with regard to email archiving. At the same time, practitioners, however, provided a different perspective on the matter. Though being interested in email archiving and my research in general, several large uh, institutions responded that emails are not the major focus of their interest because, and that is a quote, we don't archive emails, but files. I'm pretty sure many of you know that, <laughs> that answer. At this point, it is really important to know that the file is the key genre of Austrian administrative culture. Electronic records management systems form the heart of Austrian administrative and archival thinking, and if you question their functionality, of course, you question the entire system. In the last few years, however, recent political scandals have been questioning the concept of the file. There were media reports on the private use of official email accounts, forgery email, a printed email scandal, and finally, once again, that's just a news article from uh, yesterday, the systematic deletion of email accounts after a change in government. And as a researcher, as well as a citizen, I therefore was still convinced that Austrian archives should at least discuss the capstone approach. I mean, they don't have to apply it, but we should at least start a discussion on that. According to Fiorella Foscarini and Gillian Oliver, who are experts in uh, information culture, you should not fight information cultures, but develop workarounds. For me, historical source studies evolved as such a workaround. At this point, it is interesting uh, to know that Austria has a historical archival tradition. This means that archivists are commonly trained as historians. And by employing a source studies approach and discussing the historical rather than the archival value of email, I therefore aim to align my research with Austrian archival thinking by asking, what would a historian do? So what do I mean by source studies? Source shores are an essential part of diplomatics. According to the German archivist Holger Beerwinkel, source shores facilitate historical research by outlining the historical value, characteristics in content, context, and form, as well as archival traditions regarding a certain type of historical source. So overall, shores guide, facilitate, and verify expectations about a source and direct the content analysis of that source. So from an archival perspective, we therefore can conclude source studies conduct expectation management because classifications are first and foremost systems of thinking that make generalizations in order to render complexity comprehensible. Taking this into account, it is probably important to mention as well that I didn't employ a diplomatic analysis of email. That wasn't my goal. Instead, I evaluated how email as a medium corresponds with existing classifications and how the epistemology of source studies can inform uh, digital archiving. 
A very important aspect about historical source criticism is the analysis of the original form. But what is the original form in the case of electronic mail? The terminology of the Society of American Archivists provides a technical perspective on email. It outlines that email either can be conceived as an individual email message or as the email system itself. Overall, this, de this definition raises more questions than answers. Is email a historical chameleon? From my perspective, yes, it is. Christian Keitel, honorary professor in archival science at the University of Applied Sciences in Germany, therefore suggests a new approach to the digital source studies. Since digital information can take on multiple ma manifestations, he suggests that a source classification must rely on the technical version captured for preservation. And this is the moment where the capstone comes in. By relying on files, for email archiving, Austrian archives automatically and implicitly consider email as message. Such a perspective prioritizes the business process and puts email into a functional continuity to analog government records. The capstone approach, however, adopts a different perspective. It relies on the unit of the email system by supporting the archiving of email in the form of mailboxes. By doing so, it conceptualizes email as a personal collection of correspondence with an individual arrangement. These findings are similar to a report of the Dutch National Archive, which already recommended thinking of email as a correspondence in 2019, which is quite interesting, I think. According to the German archivist and archival theorist Heinrich Otto Meisner, however, government agencies at least in Germany and in Austria, do not write letters and officials do not create but follow structure. So based on traditional source classification systems, the capstone approach structurally transforms official records into private, private rec records. As such, they demand different historical approaches and now it's getting interested, it impacts the historical value of government email. Whereas email as a message prioritizes content information within the business process context, email as correspondence illuminates the context of action of individual officials. According to the Austrian archivist and historian, Michael Ruch-Edlinger, correspondence of officials are essential historical sources on administrative culture. The so-called Schreibtischnachlass, which in English means an individual collection of personal papers and supportive materials used by officials in the course of their business, has, they have been commonly considered for preservation in the analog era. And from this perspective, it is not so controversial to consider email as correspondence for preservation, even in Austria. So what can we as archivists learn from email as historical sources. Within archival science, there are multiple definitions of email which prioritize different layers of information. Just as flexible is the context of email as David Bierman already noted that email is a multifunctional utility. From my experience, the methodology of source studies provides a structured way to systematically think through these multiple layers and to unravel the different contexts and relationships manifested in them, such as textual, structural, functional, and technical um, relationships. Moreover, my research suggests that source shores are a strong means to make implicit assumptions about government documentation explicit. By rather focusing on the outcome rather than the output of appraisal decisions, it is a useful tool to evaluate what kind of archival documentation do we want to create? What is the impact of appraisal on the scope of use, the interpretability and the evidential function of email archives? And finally, based on my um, Austrian research experience, the human aspect of email archives also must not be underestimated. 
From my experience, working with email archives means working with people and value is just such a versatile and dynamic concept. There are so many new facets to be explored all the time. So being curious and just daring to taking this step, I think shifting, taking a shift in perspective is certainly always um, just an enriching perspective. Yeah, so I hope you enjoyed this shift in perspective and thank you again for the invitation and thank you for your attention. Well, thank you so much for that, Maria. And I, I certainly appreciate the um, uh, perspective on context and on um, source studies as a as a key input to um, to our appraisal. Uh, also, I, I didn't quite capture your German word there for the entirety of the context of an individual's records, but that that deeply resonated with me because our own founding archivist here at the University of Illinois had spent a pretty significant amount of time um, working in German and Austrian repositories as part of a Fulbright grant and factored that um, that source perspective into his own appraisal theory as well. So I'm, I'm just very appreciative for your perspective and, and comments here. Um, we do have a little bit of time for questions, so I'm just going to check here to see if anyone has any questions that they've submitted uh, for your presentation. Um, not, not seeing anything, I would certainly encourage people to submit questions either through Q&A and would also remind you that you can raise your hand at any time, and we're happy to um, allow you in um, and unmute you and allow you to ask a question directly as well. Yeah, and if there is no question right now, also feel free to get in touch afterwards via email. <laughs> emails about emails are always fun. I was also very glad to see your connection to Scotland. I had had no idea prior to seeing the slides, but um, my own connection to email archiving comes through Scotland as well as, as part of time that I was fortunate enough to spend at the University of Dundee, um, which, which led ultimately to me writing about it and getting involved in email archiving. So, so there's always that Scottish connection there. I'm not sure if any of our Scottish colleagues are on, on here today, but certainly very appreciative of, of the excellent work that comes out of Glasgow, including your own. Yeah, maybe it's the Scottish weather. I don't know. There is something special going on in Glasgow, in the <laughs> Glasgow area. There's lots of time during those dark winters, right? <laughs> yeah. Maria, that was great. This is Jessica. I hope to um, contact you and I'd like to talk more as well. Thank you. Yeah, feel free to just drop me an email. Um, that would be amazing. Thank you, Maria. And hi, Megan. I see you have your hand raised. I think we've unmuted you. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. I was just, um, thank you. This presentation was was wonderful and very thought provoking. Um, and I was um, really intrigued by your contrast um, between the, the captured approach and kind of using a source analysis for that. And I was trying to type this in the chat, I couldn't type it. But I'm wondering if you think that there's sort of a, um, a challenge where a lot of our, that arises from traditionally approaching correspondence, where it's one person's letters and the, the physicality of the letter, and then um, email being such a different system, like we were hearing yesterday, where there is uh, there are multiple copies and there's sort of linking and multiple threading, um, and that that presents some of the challenges to to um, the source um, the source study, like the treat, treating the one source like the other source. I hope that makes some sense. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that comment, and uh, that's a super question because that leads me to one aspect which really surprised me about my um, study in historical source studies that there is no common sense on correspondence and letters in an analog sense neither. So there has been a very vibrant debate on what is a letter and what is not a letter. And it hasn't been really resolved in the analog um, world neither. So yeah, that's also some kind of continuity which, which seems to continue with email. So, yeah, I think correspondence is just so diverse in format, medium, and even how 
you communicate with each other is also so diverse. So that's really difficult to, to capture that in the analog world as well. But yeah, it also leads to the fact that because there is such a vibrant debate about that and so less clarity that it is not really discussed because everyone knows that there is no direct solution. So that's a major challenge. If you're always seeking for a perfect solution, um, yeah, it's quite difficult to discuss. Thank you. Hey, well, thank you again, Maria. I see we're um, to uh, 9.45 here, our time. We certainly appreciate you're doing this in your evening time from, from Austria again. Um, Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. And I hope you get a chance to um, see some of our other presentations here because I, I know they'll, we learn so much from all of our colleagues across the world and, and hope, you know, at the, by the same token that we can continue to have this international exchange. So again, just thank you. We I will remind everyone we have um, a break now. We will come back at 10 a.m. Central Time here at the top of the hour with David Kirsch from the University of Maryland. And we're looking forward to hearing about David's project, which is one of the EABCC projects. So again, um, look forward to seeing many of you, if not all of you, back here at um, the top of the hour. <laughs>